Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us um, for the Renewable Materials webinar. Uh, I apologize so much <clears throat> for the delayed start. We had some technical difficulties with GoToWebinar, um, but we still have a great session planned for today, and we thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a lot of you in attendance are part of the Embodied Carbon Network, um, but we do have some new faces, uh, so a little bit of background. Um, the Embodied Carbon Network is a communications and knowledge sharing platform uh, meant to bring individuals working um, in or with the building sector uh, together to share resources, engage in discussion, and organize to take action. Uh, we have over 230 members um, from across the building sector, academia, nonprofit, and government groups. Um, and we are located all across the world. I think last I checked, we have we've 76 global cities covered. Um, we, on the ground, a lot of our work um, it might be different, but in the Embodied Carbon Network, we share a common mission to um, track, reduce, and, in, and design embodied carbon emissions out of the built environment um, in order to meet carbon neutrality targets, in particular by 2050. Uh, so in the Embodied Carbon Network, we have nine subject-specific task forces. Um, so these are available for members to join to have more um, uh, in-depth, focused uh, conversation and collaboration. Uh, the um, the uh, Embodied Carbon Network was convened by the Carbon Leadership Forum, um, which is a group out of the University of Washington led by Kate Simonen. Um, so the Carbon Leadership Forum um, works together on different research, education, and outreach projects centered around embodied carbon. And um, the Embodied Carbon Network came out of an identified need that there really wasn't a mechanism for um, people doing similar work to come together and share what they're learning and uh, uh, leverage each other. So thank you to the Carbon Leadership Forum and um, its sponsors for supporting the network and this webinar series. So this session is, is part of an eight-part um, webinar series happening throughout the year. Um, it's being driven by the different task forces, um, leveraging the, the expertise that we have in our network um, and translating it back to more broader audiences. Um, each session will be eligible for um, AIA continuing education credits. So I'll leave some information at the end on how you can um, go about getting that. So we have a really great session planned for today. Um, we're going to be joined by David Arkin, uh, Jacob Raskusen. Sorry, Jacob, I just noticed I have a typo in your name. Uh, Massey Burke and Bruce King. Um, so David is going gonna, is gonna to get us kicked off um, today by talking more about what renewable materials are and which in particular um, are great for carbon sequestration. Um, so David is a founding member and current director of the California uh, Building Association, CASBA. Um, he has taught and lectured on the subject of sustainable design for over 20 years. Uh, David and his wife, Annie Tilt, are the principals of Arc and Tilt Architects, an award-winning um, San Francisco Bay Area firm specializing, spe specializing in energy and resource efficient design. Um, so David's going to get us kicked off, and I'm going to hand over to you, David. All right. Thank you, Tina. And I'll presume that my uh, slideshow is up in front of the webinar. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, and thanks for joining us. Um, because we had a bit of a slow start, I'm going to move through this. Um, let's see. There, we should be up now. Um, uh, move through this quickly. As Tina mentioned, I'm in my fifth year as director of the California Straw Building Association and also serving as uh, chair of the Renewable Materials Task Force, which is why I've been tagged to lead off this morning. I uh, want to invite all of our uh, attendees to join us at our upcoming West Coast Natural Building Conference. Um, you can find all the information at strawbuilding.org. So uh, renewable materials uh, is what we'll be discussing uh, here this morning. And I want to uh, make a um, thank you uh, publicly to our team, uh, 38 strong that have joined the Renewable Materials Task Force. 
So renewable materials can be summed up as um, having some or all of these attributes. Um, many are photosynthetic. They are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, uh, releasing the oxygen and locking the carbon away uh, in the fiber of the plant materials. Um, the best ones are rapidly renewable, usually on an annual uh, regrowth cycle uh, or quickly growing. Uh, hemp, straw, bamboo uh, are sort of our leading uh, materials. They're always locally available, so we're able to minimize the transportation impacts of these materials. Um, Ultra-low CO2 examples are um, uh, various uh, cementitious uh, pro uh, materials, clay, um, is, is probably the most ubiquitous material on earth to be used. And they are minimally processed. So there's very little energy uh, and, and carbon footprint involved in bringing them from the, the resource to the building site. Um, our earth contains five carbon sinks. This is probably not new information to anyone on this phone call, um, but we posit that the built environment uh, can be and should be the Earth's sixth carbon sink. Um, that we are, if there's anything we as humans are gonna continue to do on the planet, it's, it's build buildings and infrastructure. And the more we can use carbon uh, in that activity. If there's anything I want you to take away from this morning's webinar, it's this simple mantra, um, build with carbon, not too big, mostly plants. And those of you who are familiar with Michael Pollan's food rules uh, know that that's a variation on, on what he posits there. So quickly to review some examples of renewable materials, rammed earth, uh, one of the oldest technologies for creating shelter on the planet, uh, still a viable option. PZE is a sprayed version of rammed earth, uh, an acronym for pneumatically impacted stabilized earth pioneered by David Easton, um, able to use gunite equipment to spray a, a low cement uh, earth mixture into place. A more recent innovation is compressed earth blocks, uh, what, what David refers to as watershed block. And uh, this is uh, done in a module very similar to concrete masonry units, but with low or no cement content in it. So greatly reducing its carbon footprint. And um, examples are being built of, of that type of technology. Uh, clay is often found very near most building sites uh, throughout the planet, and it is a low strength concrete uh, that can be used as a uh, finish on uh, many wall surfaces. Uh, straw bale uh, is, of course, one that we're very fond of. Um, uh, it's a resource that is not new. Uh, it was a, it's a uniquely American invention pioneered in the late 1800s, and many of those early buildings are still standing today. Um, it is in the building code, uh, introduced by several CASBA members and friends uh, to the International Residential Code in 2015, and um, it provides guidelines for both residential as well as commercial buildings. And a free download of this code with commentary is available from the CASBA website, again, strawbuilding.org. And one of the best attributes of straw is its ability to sequester carbon. Um, this is a graphic from uh, White Design of the UK, and you can see the metrics, um, but a significant amount of CO2 can be captured and sequestered uh, within each and every straw bale. And of course, lovely buildings can be constructed um, using this technology. Um, in the UK, they've pioneered some panelized systems. Um, Chris Magwood at the Endeavor Center has developed variations on these. And in Slovakia, um, a um, straw-based uh, panel called Eco Cocoon is, is popular in use. Uh, continued variations of these materials, light straw clay is a um, way of taking loose straw, coating it with a clay slip, which was a liquidy mixture of water and clay, and tamping it into place between formwork um, uh, to create insulated wall panels. Uh, hempcrete is a uh, similar mixture, but using the hemp herd in a chopped version, coating it with uh, a lime cement and then once again tamping it into place 
and uh, creating highly insulative walls uh, as a substrate for plaster. Um, there is a long history of other clay straw um, materials. Adobe, which can still be found in our building code, um, is dried clay and straw bricks. Um, more uh, modern variations are being developed of these. Uh, and then clay straw mixtures, uh, one is cob, but um, people are taking it to a new level with 3D printing using uh, clay mud and plant fiber. Um, bamboo, we mentioned, is a rapidly renewable resource. Uh, not only can it be used in its raw form, but there's a California company that's pioneered a wall system um, without studs. So both the inner and outer layers uh, are structural load bearing and it creates a uh, perfect insulation cavity with no thermal bridging and beautiful examples are being created with BAM core. Um, wood is probably the most uh, uh, well-known renewable material and uh, it of course grows on trees, captures carbon dioxide and uh, stores it away in the uh, material itself. Uh, cross laminated timber or mass timber is a uh, way of utilizing um, a lot of wood and storing the carbon in it. And we're, of course, approaching um, taller and taller buildings, timber frame and CLT um, uh, uh, as a substitute for concrete and steel. And we and others are pioneering uh, trying to take the Portland cement out of our foundations uh, to the greatest degree possible. Um, uh, rock, compacted rock trench uh, was something Frank Lloyd Wright was using uh, 60 and 70 years ago. Just some other renewable materials that uh, we can be integrating into our buildings, um, cork, compressed straw, wood fiberboard as sheathing materials, uh, cork again, wood or the bark from the trees as siding materials. Um, cellulose, which is uh, often recycled newspaper or other paper products, um, sheep's wool, cotton denim are insulation materials. And uh, when we start to look at the comparative carbon footprint of these, uh, of the insulation options that are currently available to us, we see that um, many of these renewable materials have negative um, carbon footprints or they're actually sequestering carbon and this is what we get back to where we started which is you know building structures with carbon uh, to pull it out of the atmosphere. Just to mention a couple others that are coming online which are of interest uh, mushrooms or mycelium as an insulation material as well as packing and then uh, most recently I learned of a, a root mat barley and oat roots uh, being grown and then sterilized and capable of insulating our buildings. So our job as the Renewable Materials Task Force is to catalog all of these um, lesser known options, um, to provide comparisons of them with other materials, and finally communicate. And uh, so joining me today to help do this, uh, Jacob Brickusen will be discussing and comparing the carbon impacts of different building systems. Uh, Massey Burke will be using straw as an example to compare the supply chain impacts of natural materials. And finally, Bruce King will speak to the barriers and opportunities um, of renewable materials and putting them into a global context. So, Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, David, for getting us kicked off. And um, we've had some questions come through. And so uh, as you all are listening and having questions, just please submit them through the GoToWebinar function. And I will be tracking these questions and we'll have time at the end to um, ask them and I'll direct them to uh, our presenters. Um, so uh, next up, we have Jacob. Uh, Jacob is a co-owner of New Frameworks Natural Design Build, um, offering services in green remodeling, new construction, consultation, and education featuring low-impact, high-performance building technologies. Uh, through Jacob's work as a designer, builder, consultant, and educator, he is able to merge his passions for fine craft, ecological stewardship, relationship to place, and social justice. Uh, he is a program director of the Certificate in Building Science and Net Zero Design at the Esther Morrow Design Build School and is a BPI certified contractor and certified passive house consultant. Um, so, so, Jacob, take it away. I'll get you. 
All right, uh, everyone can see my screen? Yes. Great. Uh, so uh, I am going to be looking at putting the uh, some of the materials that David just uh, introduced to us, uh, the profile of, of renewable materials, into context. Um, looking at some some real buildings, so or some model buildings. Pardon me. Um, the, uh, there's a series of slides uh, from a presentation that my colleague Ace McCarlton, uh, my partner Ace McCarlton, and colleague Chris Magwood, um, also ECN members, um, and I presented on uh, the conference last week. So. Uh, I'll take you on a spin through what these materials look like in context. Uh, this is a variation of a slide that David uh, showed just a, a, a few minutes ago here. Uh, again, really, the, this is the, the thing that we have to offer uh, as advocates of using renewable materials. Uh, not only do we have the opportunity to reduce the net embodied carbon emissions of our materials, but this is really our, our strongest opportunity for turning our buildings into carbon sinks, into being you know, proactively removing carbon from the atmosphere through the process of, um, of building. And so, you know, looking at hempcrete, straw bale, and cellulose as uh, a range of different materials that really jump out just if you let your eyes sort of gloss over and look at the, you know, big bands of green moving to the left side of zero, that is, uh, that's what we're looking for. And whether that's to achieve a goal of having a building uh, become fully net zero carbon uh, or be, you know, act as a carbon sink, um, or whether you are looking at um, optimizing the carbon storing potential of materials within this division, in this case, we're looking at insulation as a case study, um, to help uh, offset the inevitable um, embodied carbon load of other divisions like windows or roofing that may be harder to, uh, harder to, to mitigate as easily. So that's, that's our, um, you know, our pitch here in working with these materials is that we really could take something that could be a tremendous liability, uh, insulation in the form of high density spray foam, uh, and turning it into a, a great opportunity. So what we did, oh, let me just go small. So what we did um, in um, trying to wrap our heads around not just comparing between different insulation materials, but really how does this play out in the context of a whole building. And we modeled a 1,000 square foot home um, in Ontario, um, Chris's home climate, which is very similar to Ace and mine in Vermont. Um, and we sort of fixed the interior footprint uh, and allowed the assembly to change dimension and count carbon accordingly based on different material profiles. So for example, uh, to get the same R value wall assembly out of straw, you need a significantly thicker wall relative to spray foam. So we grew the foundation and the roof accordingly um, and modeled the buildings accurately as we could in real world conditions. Uh, all of the vast majority of the data we used were from EPDs uh, that came from manufacturers or industry associations. Uh, and we filled in a little bit, uh, for example, straw and hemp or EPDs didn't exist with uh, data from the uh, ICE database. So we started, no, come on. Pardon me. Let's see if I can get this to play nice. There we go. So we started uh, just a quick look at two code minimum buildings, one built with predominantly high carbon materials, um, so brick cladding, um, high density spray foam throughout for insulation, and then one using um, a you know, strong profile of renewable and low carbon materials. Um, we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm not going to you know, draw out all the highlights here. Um, you can take a moment and go back through uh, the webinar, which will be available afterwards to get all the juicy data points. But suffice to say, these pie graphs are roughly in scale, and we're not looking at carbon storage here. This is just the reduced embodied carbon um, values of these materials before looking at their storage potential. Um, so just, you know, we're just out the gate before we even look at uh, the carbon storage benefits of working with renewable materials, we're looking at a profile of ultra low carbon uh, options, which is, you know, a great place to start from. Um, we then want to go deeper and look at a couple of other points of, of comparison here. And so one of that being the different performance levels, what would happen if we bump the performance up to uh, you know, a high performance standard of construction, which would rely on more insulation, um, a bigger material profile. For those of you that care about the numbers, uh, just to tell you what this coding means, under high performance, one is one ACH50 air tightness, 
R5 windows and doors, R20 sub slab insulation, R30 below grade walls, R40 above grade walls, R60 attic. And so that's a kind of a, a standard high performance package, uh, enclosure package you might find in a cold climate uh, such as ours. Uh, so we're looking at the difference of impact between a typical code building, code minimum building, and a high performance enclosure. Um, looking at the high embodied carbon versus um, low carbon, carbon storing, natural renewable material profile. Um, and also looked at um, uh, whereas the last building that you saw we modeled using kind of a worst case scenario materials, we looked at more standard materials as well for a code minimum building, such as using fiberglass or vinyl siding. Uh, instead of spray foam and brick cladding. Um, and we also want to put this into the context of embodied carbon um, compared to operational carbon between now and 2050. So we looked, modeled that, um, looking at those two scenarios against uh, either a high performance boiler, high efficiency boiler, a natural gas, and a, a mini split uh, air source heat pump uh, in a cold climate. So that, that COP is reflecting cold climate conditions. And so for those of you that care about the numbers and like the numbers, they're in the middle for you. Um, but the, I would encourage you to sort of look to the left at just the geometry of these comparative graphs. So just to explain the graph, um, this is um, accumulated net carbon emissions over time. So if you multiply the x and the y axis, you're not going to get the data point. Uh, what you're seeing here is this horizontal band of orange reflects the embodied carbon of that building that was, um, you know, Put out into the atmosphere on day zero, and that uh, ascending slope, uh, sort of maroon triangle, shows the accumulated uh, operational carbon between 2018 and 2050 along the x-axis. And so this shouldn't be terribly surprising to pretty much you know anyone in this group that's looking at this stuff. The obviously the code minimum building, the operational carbon, is higher than the embodied carbon. Um, what was a really interesting note for us was that you could build a code minimum building in Ontario and be putting out you know significantly less carbon by 2050 than building a high performance building uh, using uh, uh, spray foam and other high carbon uh, materials. Uh, so that was that was definitely a pretty you know a pretty interesting point of note for us. And so of course we wanted to go a little bit further and figure out how that modeled using our uh, sort of portfolio of renewable materials. Um, what was thrilling to see when we're using, um, you know, optimizing for carbon storage, uh, that same performance enclosure levels, uh, we were getting uh, essentially ne uh, a net zero, uh, you know, negative carbon up until we get to year 2030 is where the operational carbon starts to creep us over the line. Uh, and that's, again, using a natural gas fuel source uh, with a high efficiency boiler. Um, and so again, the, the operational carbon is the same between the top and bottom cases, and the difference is one of these emits a tremendous amount of embodied carbon, whereas the other stores an appreciable amount to get to the same enclosure performance levels. And so then we want to take a look, okay, well, what happens if we switch from um, the uh, uh, fossil fuel-based um, heating system? And again, we're only looking at heating loads for operational carbon, so just to you know, put that out there. Uh, we're in a uh, cold climate, and so that was the um, that's the only impact. We're not looking at plug loads or other associated uh, operational loads for the sake of this this comparison. Um, so what was great to see once we moved on to um, uh, the electric grid, and this is using Ontario's grid uh, carbon emission values uh, using a cold climate heat pump. We stay you know, as a, as a really strong carbon sink all the way through to 2050 using our renewable uh, sort of, uh, carbon storage optimized materials. Uh, it's, it's fair to say, however, that not every builder and designer is going to be switching over to straw and uh, clay plaster uh, tomorrow. So we did want to take a look, okay, what could we use, uh, what could we model for a building using materials that are commonly available today? So a more kind of conventional platform of renewable materials. And so we're looking at dense packed cellulose, um, fiberboard sheathing, um, wood finishes throughout where possible. Uh, so something that any builder could you know, bring online tomorrow using commonly sourced materials. And we're still finding that building is achieving net zero carbon by 2050. 
So for us, that was really exciting that this, um, you know, there are, there's a range of different types of renewable materials in different fashions with different degrees of, um, you know, difficulty um, in changing current practices to accommodate their inclusion in our designs and buildings. Um, and even as, at a lower, sort of more immediate level, we can still be creating net zero buildings um, uh, today. And so uh, Massey is going to start talking about the um, sort of supply chain of these materials. And the thing that just, you know, we got really excited about in looking at this is that we have this really strong opportunity in working with this profile of materials to link us back to the source of these materials. And so for us that are really actively engaged in the sustainable building world, it gives us this uh, wonderful intersection with um, industries working in sustainable agriculture and sustainable silviculture to support and be supported by their efforts. And so that's, uh, you know, that is the broader and deeper um, view behind this. It's not just a chart of comparative insulation materials. It really opens up a pathway for um, some inter-industry collaboration to really maximize and leverage our potential for the, the benefits that these renewable materials can offer us. That's it for me. Great, thank you so much, Jacob. Um, and I will go ahead and introduce Massey. So Massey Burke is a natural material specialist in the San Francisco Bay Area. Her work centers on research, design, and hands-on implementation of building with low carbon natural materials with an interest in, imply, in applying natural building to existing buildings and the urban fabric. She also teams up with organizations such as the California Straw Building Association and the Ecological Building Network to generate technical information on carbon and natural materials in the built environment and works on code issues surrounding natural materials through the Cobb Research Institute and other collaborators. All right, take it away, Massey. <laughs> Thank you. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. OK, great. Um, so yeah, uh, Jacob, thank you very much for that great setup. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk, uh, focus on straw uh, as an example of how we can look at and think about supply chains uh, for renewable materials as an opportunity. Um, we have this really interesting, uh, natural materials are interesting because they tend to be, as David mentioned, uh, minimally processed. And so we have much greater access to an ability to interact with where they come from uh, and how the supply chain functions. Um, and that, as it turns out, is um, a potentially a pretty major carbon sequestering opportunity. Uh, so as David mentioned, uh, straw as a building material um, is very versatile, uh, can be used in a lot of different ways uh, in the building, uh, in the fabric of the building. Uh, and it typically uh, functions as a high performance insulator. Um, if you're going to understand or assess the carbon sequestering capacity of straw, uh, it's important to understand the ecology of straw and what it is, uh, both uh, on the scale of the plant and also on the scale of the ecology of the straw producing ecosystem. Um, so uh, most straw globally comes from our cereal grasses, so grasses that produce grain that we eat. Uh, and that will tend to be uh, the grasses listed here, wheat, rice, oats, or barley. Um, and then when you're looking at a grass um, in microcosm, uh, we grow these grasses for their inflorescence, which is the grain producing part of the grass. Um, the stalk is what becomes straw. So it dries out after the grain is harvested uh, and is bundled or mixed with other materials um, to go into a building. Uh, and then, of course, the roots, because it's a plant. And the roots are, I'll talk more about this in a little bit, but of the roots, in a very basic sense, bring nutrients to the plant. But they also, and especially in a grassland ecosystem, uh, help the plant uh, bring nutrients into the soil. Uh, so grasses uh, are able to sequester carbon uh, in two modes. Uh, and so there's above ground. Uh, carbon sequestration that happens just in the biomass of a plant. And this is very similar to how carbon is sequestered in trees. Um, the actual fabric of the plant growing draws carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turns it into um, plant material uh, and keeps it out of atmospheric, the pool of atmospheric carbon for as long as that plant material does not break down. Um, and 
uh, grasses also sequester carbon below ground through their interactions with the soil microbiology. Uh, and this is turning out to be fairly important uh, for the carbon accounting for straw. Um, so as I mentioned above ground, uh, so the two ways that these grass behaviors become stored carbon, uh, above ground, uh, the grass makes plant material, uh, draws carbon dioxide out of the atm atmosphere and creates grain and then straw. Uh, and when you store that straw in the fabric of a building or somewhere else where it isn't gonna break down uh, for a long period of time, uh, and straw buildings have a long lifespan, if they're built correctly, uh, then you have a carbon sink. Um, the carbon that has been converted from carbon dioxide into straw uh, stays that way uh, in a protected environment like a building. Um, below ground, uh, uh, and this gets more interesting and more complicated, um, the grasses draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, um, release extra plant sugars into the soil microbiome and feed the soil microbiome. And the soil microbes convert that material, the processes of photosynthesis from a grass um, into stable soil carbon. And so you get a carbon sink uh, in that format as well in the process of creating um, straw from grasses. So what's interesting about this uh, is that um, the carbon, the way that carbon is sequestered um, is affected differently depending on which part of the process you're looking at. So it doesn't really matter how you grow straw uh, when you're looking at the capacity of straw itself to sequester carbon. Um, no matter what kind of farming ecosystem you're working with, the straw is going to have carbon in it. And if that straw does not break down, it behaves as a carbon sink. On the other hand, uh, the below ground sequestration process depends a whole lot on how the straw is grown uh, because not all straw producing farming ecosystems are created equal. Um, some are much more supportive of soil carbon sequestration than others. You know, so a typical modern cereal cropland, if you're growing one of the four major grains um, in our modern idiom, uh, it's typically going to be uh, what we would call a monoculture, which means that it's all focused on one uh, type of plant that's probably an annual plant, so it needs to be reseeded every year. Um, usually dependent on a lot of chemical inputs and also a lot of tilling, um, and often has uh, long periods of bare ground where there's no photosynthetic process. Um, and all of these um, activities tend to suppress the soil microbiome and actually release carbon from the soil. So in modern industrial uh, cereal grass growing um, tends to be a net carbon emitter. On the other hand, uh, there is a growing body of work um, and practice called regenerative agriculture collectively, and that, act that captures uh, a multiplicity of practices. Um, but people are developing carbon sequestering croplands, and these are characterized by uh, five to eight species, or sometimes more, grown together that are complementary in their photosynthetic processes, and these uh, frequently include one of the major uh, cereal grain crops, so straw producing crops. Um, these systems are characterized by very minimal chemical inputs and tilling uh, and a lot of um, plant coverage, so avoiding leaving bare ground. So there's photosynthetic process happening year round or as much as possible depending on your climate. Um, and because these types of systems support the soil microbiome, they uh, sequester carbon. Um, and they sequester carbon by design. So really when you're talking about um, the capacity for um, cropland uh, carbon sequestration by design and straw as a part of that process, it's really about understanding uh, soil and how the soil sequesters carbon. Um, and a few notes on soil in the big picture. Um, there, it's really important to understand that this is a, a quickly growing body of understanding. Uh, 
um, how our um, how many different parts of the ecological economy relate to soil carbon sequestration and also how how big of a carbon sink soil can be. Uh, so in the most recent IPCC report, um, the capacity of soil to sequester carbon only accounts for the top 12 inches. But we now know, and we've learned this pretty recently, uh, and people are still studying this, um, that especially in a grassland or a cropland ecosystem, uh, the soil carbon the soil carbon goes uh, a lot deeper than that. Uh, there are places in Australia where it's been documented. Um, there's been soil carbon documented down to eight feet, uh, which is completely is very different than how we've been thinking of soil and soil carbon, uh, especially in the West. Um, and so soil carbon is probably a much bigger potential carbon sink than we understood before. You may, and I think this is important to note because uh, when you hear even very recent discussions of soil carbon, uh, there's this idea that the soil will become saturated at some point with carbon and not be able to perform as a sink beyond that point. And increasingly, we're learning that that's just simply not true. We don't really know what the size of the potential carbon sink of soil is globally, but it's a lot bigger than we thought. And the other really interesting aspect from a cropland perspective is that rebuilding soil carbon stocks is critically important even if we weren't dealing with climate change uh, because these carbon stocks have been depleted through industrial agriculture uh, and the soil carbon is critical to the resiliency uh, and productivity of a cropland. So there are co-benefits uh, that are uh, very important when we begin to approach um, soils and the supply chain of straw as a material um, as, a, as a carbon sequestering opportunity. Uh, so what do we do with this as a community? Uh, I think at this point, it's most important to understand the potential. Um, and as designers to, um, as David mentioned, to know that these materials are available and also really up and coming. Um, you know, it's, and also as, they, as Jacob, I think made very clear, carbon and thinking about carbon has really leveled the playing field for the use of natural materials. Um, because they're um, they're fairly unbeatable in their ability to respond positively to climate change. Uh, and we have this massive opportunity that still needs creative focus um, for how that can happen um, all the way along the supply chain as well as in the building. And that's it for me. Great. Thank you so much, Massey. You've definitely given us a lot to think about. Um, and we're going to move on to Bruce King. And Bruce King is going to uh, wrap us up. And since we had a bit of a delayed start, um, we'll go ahead and push our webinar back. And um, for those of you that can stick around for questions, that's great. Um, if not, uh, that's OK. Um, so Bruce King is the prime author and senior editor of The New Carbon Architecture. He's the founder of the Ecological Building Network and a registered engineer with 40 years of worldwide experience in structural engineering and construction. He is also um, author of Buildings, Earth and Straw, Making Better Concrete, Design of Straw Bale Buildings, um, Earthen Building Guidelines, and so forth. Uh, Bruce has organized three international conferences on ecological building, and he is the founder of Buildwell Source, a user-based collection of low carbon materials, knowledge, and of the Buildwell Symposia. Uh, so, Bruce, uh, take it away for us. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to Zoom, since I'm going to assume that a lot of you listening have to uh, be off it at the hour. Good news is we're learning how to uh, make buildings not only less bad, but even good for the climate by uh, embodying carbon. The bad news is that we have to build a lot of them. We're putting up the equivalent of another New York City every 35 days right now. And it's not single family homes. It's not hand, lovingly handcrafted straw bale homes in the woods, I'm sorry to say. It's in East Asia and India and other places where the population is growing so fast. And it's urban and it's tall. It looks like this. What do we have to offer them? Well, Apple had a great uh, marketing line and maybe we can do the same thing. What do we have to offer to people all over the world who are living in much different circumstances? Well, for one thing, to go tall, you don't need concrete and steel. Everybody thinks you do, but you don't. We have, uh, David already showed you a picture of Shabam in Yemen on the right, clay-based concrete, it's called Cobb. And 
12 stories high and been there for a thousand years, continuously occupied. On the left, another mass timber building where they used wood instead of steel and concrete to get a high urban building. What about insulation? Well, everybody loves that spray foam because you can do so much with it. It's hard not to like, but it, boy, it's a hit on the climate. And we say, put away that hazmat suit, you don't need it. You can use straw, you can use hemp, you can use other things. And more products are appearing all the time that don't require, they're not based up basically on cheap fossil fuels. What about just cool buildings? Frank Gehry and other things. You may not like one particular architect and like another, but I'm of the opinion we ought to have cool buildings, especially in our cities, inspiring or mind-changing buildings. And um, do they have to be made out of stainless steel? No, they don't. Uh, we're starting to do stuff just with good old wood that is um, really breaking all the boundaries of what we thought was possible. Beautiful, lovely, exciting architecture with renewable materials. And while we're at it with wood, uh, the good old fashioned North American single family platform framed home is being reinvented. The notion of advanced framing or optimum value engineering has been around for a long time, but it's now getting new uh, purchase and new traction, especially in places like California where laws are coming online requiring net zero construction. And we're taking the old stud wall system and rethinking it, and you can get rid of 30% of the lumber and have a better building, a higher performing building for energy purposes. Um, that's as much as I can say about that for now, but it's pretty exciting stuff. What if we're going to use a lot more wooden buildings? Are we going to ruin the forests? No, not necessarily. Specify certified wood. Here's the big takeaway that I would offer from my whole bit is use FSC certified wood wherever you possibly can because you can maintain healthy forests like in the left-hand picture. Whereas the certification from the lumber industry such as you see on the right are not always so uh, not always so good. They're better than nothing but not that great. So if you're going to do different, uh, you're going to run into Barriers of three basic types. The building codes, which are built on the much larger body of building standards, which are built on the much larger body of research and what we know about any particular system or material. Not that much research goes into most renewable materials because they're in the public domain and there's nobody standing to make a buck by pushing straw bale or uh, bamboo buildings, with exceptions. The clunkers just means if you're introducing a new product into your uh, area or into the marketplace, there's going to be people who feel threatened by that and are going to try to stop you. And that's the reality of the marketplace we have. In culture, we're not all Russian soldiers, but we're social primates and we tend to do what everybody else is doing. It's difficult to get people at every point in the ecosystem to try to do something different than what they're used to. Code officials, engineers, framers and carpenters, everybody. It takes a little bit of work and it takes effective communication to get something new or different introduced, but sooner or later we will. A price on carbon is appearing in a lot of countries. The Europeans are way ahead of the North Americans on this, but tax on carbon and carbon marketplaces are happening more and more. The business community sees that even if the current leadership in the USA doesn't. So it will be worth money to you increasingly to have use with systems, work with materials, that have less emissions in their background and can store carbon when they're placed in the building. Some great examples of what's to come in working with nature, not against her, are um, Biomason makes bricks using enzymes at room temperature, no added uh, heat and pressure, and Ecovative is using mycelia, mushrooms, to make insulation. They're just getting going. You won't find them on the shelf just yet, but it's the beginning of what I think will be a huge wave of working with nature, especially mycelia, to make all sorts of different building products. We're gonna make things in every way possible from by hand with a bunch of your friends in the yard, uh, mixing up your cob to high tech 3D printing or additive manufacturing as it's also called. David Arkin showed a picture a little while ago of a full-scale 3D machine using cob, using clay and straw and squirting it into place. We're just starting to explore all the possibilities with how we make things and what we use when we make things. Here's a resource. Um, the natural building world, as I said, there aren't a lot of commercial sponsors, and yet there's a lot of research happening in universities and
fields all around the world. So the build well source is where users can place any cool documents they have on the material properties of something they're working with and go find material properties of something that they need to start working with. Check it out. Please add to it. It's growing all the time. There's a good book about all this stuff. I heard it's pretty good anyway. And that's it. Ha <laughs> ha. Great. Thank you so much, Bruce. And uh, and thank you, David, Jacob, and Massey for joining us today and sharing your insight and knowledge. Um, we, I'm sure, all learned uh, a lot and feel inspired to go out and um, be part of this bigger movement. Um, so thank you again, everybody, for attending today. And if you have to um, go, uh, thanks. We hope to hear from you soon. If not, we're going to stay on the line to answer some questions. Um, just a few updates. Um, we have a, another webinar coming up um, in May, and I'll send around a link um, for to register for that. Uh, of course, we have um, more information on the um, Embodied Carbon Network online, um, and we encourage you to join one or more task forces. Again, if you'd like to get AIA continuing education credits today, um, just email me your first name, last name, and AIA member. Um, and if you if you feel um, excited and like you want to um, go out and do something soon, we have some uh, upcoming events um, to talk more strategically and plan for coming together to push change. Um, so at the Architecture 2018 conference this year in New York City, um, there's going to be a Build Positive workshop on June 20th. Um, and on June 21st, uh, David Arkin and his colleague um, Craig White are also going to have a uh, an event uh, on photosynthetic materials and calculating carbon impacts. So again, I'll send out information um, to make sure you have all of this and can access what you need. And we will have the recording of this and slides online as well. So thank you very much. And uh, we will move to some questions. OK, uh, so David, we had a question come in for you. Um, someone said, let's say we did mass production of hemp insulation. How do we replace the other soil nutrients required to grow it? Uh, well, I, I like to think that uh, Massey's presentation uh, provided some insight into um, the difference between industrial agriculture and uh, more resilient and sustainable agriculture practices. Um, I don't know enough about the, the hemp industry to provide a, a thorough answer on, on what the soil impacts are, um, but I do know that uh, there are many, many sources of hemp and uh, we're, we've been contacted by um, some cannabis growers here in California um, who have an excess of the uh, stock of their plant uh, available. And unlike industrial hemp, which is grown for the fiber uh, around a very narrow herd or starchy center of the stock, the cannabis um, hemp has a very thick stock with very little fiber. So um, there are uh, other sources than just fiber hemp um, for the hemp tree. Great, thank you, David. Um, a, a question came in asking, how, and this is for Massey, how do you recover straw and separate it from so many other plants? And what does the land look like when they harvest it? Uh, wouldn't it also be bare? <laughs> That's a great question. And uh, I'll give the most annoying answer uh, that all ecological, I think everybody thinking about ecological systems gives, which is that it depends. Um, but there are, uh, so it depends on how you structure your grain growing ecosystem. Uh, and this is, these, can vary widely depending on where you're working. You know, so one of the oldest, really great examples um, of a carbon sequestering cropland is from a practitioner on, in Australia uh, who was forced into um, changing his growing practices after a, a devastating fire. Um, and so he has a very simple system where he, the structure of his cropland uh, in the winter are the native perennial grasses. Um, and part of what he produces on his farm is um, meat. So they, the, there's grazing as a part of this uh, ecosystem. But the perennial grasses die back in the winter. Uh, and as they're doing that, he seeds grains among them. 
in the summer. And so the cover it, the perennial grasses maintain the soil coverage um, while the straw is growing, but in a, a dormant state. Um, and then when you get to the when you get to the point where you're harvesting grain, uh, the only thing that's sticking up out of that cropland is the annual grain crop. And so you can harvest it fairly conventionally. Um, but that's the probably the simplest example. Um, some of these other systems where there are five to eight species together often uh, um, harness the power of grazing animals because they'll eat everything. If you move a group of sheep or cattle through a multi-species cropland, um, the last thing they want to eat is the straw. And so if you're managing your grazing right, you can move um, in, a, in a very large area, you can graze everything down except the straw you want to harvest and then harvest the straw with the machine. So that's part of an answer for you. Great, thank you. Um, and this next question, I think that uh, um, one or maybe all of our speakers can speak to a little bit. So I'll let you guys just jump in. Um, can anyone comment on the relative cost of building with renewable materials compared to traditional building methods? Is there a financial case that can be used to argue for renewable material selection in low budget projects? I'll jump, I'll jump in, in and start. Uh, Oh, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, go for it, David. Yeah, up to you. Well, um, I would begin by noting that you know the exterior walls of a building generally make up about fifteen percent of the total cost. So, whether the walls are free or twice as expensive, um, you know the the choice is limited to those impacts. Um, what we're finding here in California with the latest round of energy efficiency requirements and and coming soon. Uh, net zero energy in all residential units by the year 2020 is that um, uh, straw as an insulation material uh, as part of a, a system um, is cost competitive with the high performance uh, walls that are required now. And, uh, and when you consider thick wall construction, straw is the most affordable. Um, there are so many other decisions that go into uh, the design of a structure, the complexity of the roof form, the uh, level of um, finish on uh, fixture selections, et cetera, um, that, that, that the walls, you know, can be a wash. And in terms of affordability, um, I think we've, we've yet to see it taken to mass production scale where um, economies of scale can be realized. And it has always represented um, a good do-it-yourself opportunity. And people have uh, chosen to do the straw bale work and the plaster work uh, themselves as opposed to hiring professionals um, because it is relatively easy and safe to work with. Jacob. Yeah, I would say um, that's that's um, the building off of what you were saying. I think the other um, sort of considerations are compared to what. And so if we're presuming we're sticking within a high performance enclosure uh, and not comparing to code minimum, which is not necessarily a fair comparison, I would say some of the more conventional materials like uh, a conventional renewable uh, materials like high recycled content cellulose or wood fiberboard um, are cost competitive in some cases, cheaper in some cases compared to uh, like the low global warming potential spray foam uh, could potentially, you know, dense back cellulose systems may actually come in less expensive. Um, fiberboard may be a slight uptick in material cost, um, but at the end of the day, might end up being somewhat negligible um, when you look at full installed cost. Uh, and then some of the more alternative renewable materials that that we work with, for example, straw bale. Um, you know, the the calculus really varies and changes because the material cost is incredibly low, the labor cost is higher. And so it really gets down into the, the quality and efficiency of the detailing um, that magnifies or reduces the labor quotient. And then the um, you know, degree of customization, it can be a whole lot more expensive if you're going for something that's more high craft. Uh, but of course, that's less of a factor of the material and more a factor of how the material is designed. Um, it also provides the opportunity for a lot of, you know, sweat equity and labor reduction if you happen to be in a project where that's um, you know something you can take advantage of and that historically has been uh, a, an angle in for people to use these materials in a very low cost fashion. I'd like to interject. The US Army built a five-story 30,000 square foot hotel in Alabama a couple of years ago. They used natural materials. They used mass timber because it was cheaper 
even bringing it from a plant up in Canada, uh, nearly a thousand miles away, they used it purely because it was cheaper, no climate considerations, nothing else. You could manufacture the floors, the columns, everything uh, in one spot in a factory, put them on a flatbed and put them all together like Tinker Toys. It went up faster, it was lighter weight, so there were less wind and seismic loads, there were less foundation loads. And it was cheaper. That's the big appeal of mass timber construction in an urban context over steel and concrete. You can prefab the whole thing and bring it in on a truck and clip it all together. Great. Thank you, Bruce. So we have time for one more question. And um, this question is, is that, you know, it, a good case has been made today on why renewable materials are are one of the best choices um, for projects. And so how can Embodied Carbon Network members, uh, people on this line and the broader group um, work to get this message out to the world and, and maybe um, other, others who, who more of a case needs to be made for? Um, and David, maybe you want to uh, start us off with that. Uh, oh, well, I would um, love to have them uh, help us answer <laughs> such a question. <laughs> no, I think it's, you know, one of the things that um, a lot of these materials uh, have in common is that they don't have a major manufacturer, corporation, marketing staff behind them. Um, they, they tend to be grown by farmers and they're a byproduct of what they're doing. Um, wood, of course, does have uh, a whole industry and uh, associations behind it, um, and they are making uh, headway into uh, so as being a viable substitute for concrete and steel for larger buildings. Um, but these other materials don't necessarily have that. So I think if we can get these materials into the databases, the lists of options, the charts of comparable embodied carbon um, footprint. Um, as designers and uh, developers uh, begin to ask themselves, how can we uh, reduce the carbon footprint of our building activities? How can we make these, you know, net um, sequesterers of materials, as long as these uh, renewable materials can be on the radar, uh, people are going to start to select them. In most cases, the information on how to use them is out there. And one of the exciting things about them is that um, not everything has been worked out. So you get to, you know, be part of a, a pioneering effort to use them. Um, so I would I would say for our um, members who are, are still on the phone call here and the broader community, um, I invite you to use them. Great, yeah, I would jump you. in as well and say there. Oh, oh go ahead. Are we out of time? Okay. No, Let's throw in a quick quick note there as well that um, you know when we talk about renewable materials, like it's a really broad palette of different materials that can be applied to different contexts and scales. Um, and then there's both the like hands-on tangible design specification and use of them. And then there is also paving the way for them to be able to get into the hands of designers and specifiers. So knowing that we represent a relatively uh, eclectic group of people, you know, for those of you that are working at larger scale, uh, for whom the uh, structure tends to be a pretty large chunk of the carbon pie, you know, starting to specify wood structures and pushing towards that in your practice is fabulous. More, those of us on the renewable, on the sort of smaller residential scale, um, you know, some of this basic insulation swap outs to dense back cellulose is a really easy way in and making more of an argument and exposing the value of that beyond just, you know, BTU saved per dollar of installed insulation, but looking at a slightly broader context of, um, you know, why a uh, you know residential client that is coming at this from a green perspective might hold more value and be willing to, uh, if there is a cost increase that's a you know relatively minor, be willing to embrace that. Uh, for those that are looking for more alternative types of materials um, and have the opportunity to, to sort of play around with that in your practice, you know, finishes are a really easy way in. Um, you know, David showed a series of different examples. Um, you know, cork, there's also ways in using, um, you know, clay uh, and lime-based materials for finishes. Then again, depending on what you're comparing to, um, can be, you know, a, a really easy way in for being able to get those materials in hand. Um, 
and then of course anyone working on the policy side of things, I know that there is a push right now, research and policy, uh, there's a an active um, uh, you know, code adoption um, movement that has been happening is continuing to happen. So if you are in the world of codes, sort of keeping your eyes out for that and getting engaged there is great. And I know that uh, we're trying to get EPDs uh, published for, you know, basically all of these materials as that becomes more of the common language for quantifying, um, you know, material carbon savings. So uh, if that happens to be your world, um, that's another great place to plug in. Uh, and then, of course, those of us that are working on tabulating and you know, sort of holding all this data um, and sharing it with each other. Um, if you're already working with these materials or starting to, um, you know, keeping track of the numbers and sharing them with each other, I know has been a very viable uh, in, in my world. So, yeah. Also, there's a good book about this. <laughs> there's a good book about this called The New Carbon Architecture. I hear it's really good. <laughs> And then just to add very briefly, uh, I think um, it's really helpful for people who work m more closely with current mainstream practice to engage in conversation with those of us who are really working on all of these questions uh, around how to scale up. But we're really at that point. How do we scale up these natural systems? Um, and that may not look like scaling up a more industrial product, uh, but conversations with people who work at large scale at this point in our development, I think, is really helpful. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, we definitely have our work cut out for us and a lot to think about from today. So thanks again um, for our speakers for uh, presenting and thank you all on the line for attending. Um, I think this is the start of a longer discussion. So uh, feel free to hop on uh, Basecamp, our communication platform and um, keep engaged. And we look forward to our, our next webinar in May and we will see you soon. Thank you.